What's up, everybody? Uh, Chris Daly here from the Sports Code, joined here by Zachary Striffler, a professional rugby player. Uh, he's played many sports in his time. So, uh, Zachary, uh, what's up, Chris? Uh, yeah, bro, good to have, good to be on the show. Yeah. So, I mean, thank you for uh, joining and everything. Just making sure my mic's working right here. Uh, so yeah, I mean, we've done this before. We're back at it now. So uh, I mean, kind of know what's <laughs> gonna happen here. So. Uh, you know, you were a very uh, successful athlete growing up in Cleveland, Ohio. I mean, getting varsity letters, hockey, um, football, and baseball. So, I mean, you know, what sport, you know, like, was hockey always the one from day one, or was it just, like, did you want to do everything? Um, I mean, growing up, we were all athletes in my family. My dad was always the coach when we were little kids. Uh, myself and my brothers were all played through high school. My sister played through high school. She still, she still exercises all the time. My younger brother is in the farm system for the Seattle Mariners as a pitcher. My other brother played played a year at Ball State, and then he had some uh, some injury issues, so he stopped playing. So it was just always a uh, we were always playing sports. It's all we ever knew. Those are all our friends. All of our cousins played it. So that was really all we knew was playing sports. Yeah, and you mentioned your brother's a pitch, uh, pitcher. So you know, have you ever been to like any games? You know, like what's that like having a brother that's kind of you know in a you know an MLB type system. It's it's one of the coolest things. I don't know. I feel like I uh, it's mainly because I'm the older brother and I just taught him everything he knows. But um, now I I had the opportunity. Uh, I went to a few of his college games. It, our schedules never really matched up because his season in springtime was always our rugby season. So I was I was unable to make a bit of it. And um, but I went to when he played independent ball last year before he got picked up with the Mariners. I was able to. Uh, to watch him play a game and he hit 98 throwing and it was one of the coolest things ever and then the next day he got called by the Mariners and got picked up yeah. so it was pretty sweet yeah it's funny I just, just saw a guy um you know how they have that like you know speed meter in like the stadium or whatever and he got signed by the, the Oakland A's and now he's living their life as you know this like minor league pitcher or whatever so uh I mean you might have mentioned uh people might have realized that you know I didn't mention rugby and I said you're a pro rugby player so after high school, you, you go to a D3 college, um, you play, you know, hockey and football. I mean, what was that, you know, time kind of like in college? Uh, college was a good time. I I went to uh, Washington Jefferson on the premise that I can compete in both football at a Division three level and then hockey at a Division one club level. Um, so that was kind of the, the, the route that I wanted to go. I was, my mindset was after high school, I was going to go play junior hockey somewhere and get picked up. Um, but, you know, we put uh, some long conversations with my parents and, and people who I trusted, uh, you know, whether that was the right option or not. Um, but we decided to move college to go with college, and I was able to get into a, a very good school. So that was nice. And I was able to do those things. And then, like you said, I was able to play both. I only ended up playing football for freshman, sophomore year. And then summer year, going into junior year, I had broken my leg uh, playing ice hockey, coincidentally, in the summertime. So that kind of left me out for football, and so from there on, I just kind of just student coached football and stayed around all my friends, but I couldn't play anymore, and I was totally fine with that. Football kind of ran its course for me. Yeah, and I mean, you mentioned, you know, uh, playing these two sports. Like, what's the, you know, the biggest difficulty about playing two sports in college while managing academics and, you know, a social life as well? Um, the, the biggest challenge, well, I mean, I suppose I would say the schedule and managing everything, but... I grew up my whole life always playing sports and always having those sports overlap and always had to, you know, make the decision whether I want to go work out or I want to go hang out with my friends. And it was, I don't want to say it was a no-brainer because sometimes when you're younger it was difficult because you want to hang out with your friends, you want to be social, but then, I don't know, I always, I got way more satisfaction out of playing with my, my teammates competing. Um, and so the biggest thing I had was just kind of staying on task with, yeah. With academics, uh, with yeah. sports always on the back burner, you know, academics kind of became the back burner a little bit for, for maybe a semester, and then the grades kind of slipped, and yeah. and I came home one summer, and my dad was like, hey, this isn't going to fly, so you, you refocus real fast on what you're there for. Yeah, so, uh, you know, you go on a trip in college to Australia, uh, that's when you discover rugby, so you, you know, you become a rugby player, I mean, just describe that moment when you kind of, you know, saw the game of rugby and fell in love with it. Yeah, so we had a very small college. They had like a really small rugby team, and it's pretty much just a fraternity, like two or three fraternities that comprise this rugby team. 
and I knew them from, you know, being around school as a small school. And they're always like, Stress, bro, you should come out and play. And I was like, yeah, nah, I've got rugby. I mean, I've got hockey. I've got football. So I had gone to Australia. And, um, you know, I was in the gym all the time. Because, I mean, besides school and, like, going out and seeing stuff, it was go to the gym. That's what I knew. And so I did that. And I met some guys in there that played rugby. Uh, they invited me out to come to, like, a training. And from day one, I was hooked. I watched as much as I could. I played as much as I could. I just got out and threw the ball around as much as I could, learned everything, and I knew from that point, I was like, all right, cool, I'm, I'm focusing on rugby. That's what I'm going to yeah. do. And so you play for some club teams in America. I mean, what was that, you know, moment like in college? You now you play for these club teams. I mean, like, how did you kind of find it, and what was it like playing, you know, amateur rugby pretty much in America? Um, it was easy to find rugby. It's, it's, such a, it's a super small community. Um, or, or it seems like a super small community until you actually are involved with it, and then you understand and you realize how massive it is. Uh, there's every city will have like five or six teams, but you would never know about it unless you knew somebody in it. So all I did is I just did a Google search. So I was a near Pittsburgh, so I just did a Google search of uh, what teams are around the area, and uh, I just showed up to a few trainings. I was 21; I was still in school, and um, just showed up. And I knew how to pass off both hands. I understood the laws of the game for the most part. Um, so I was already leaps and bounds ahead of those that have been playing for a few years. Just because yeah. I knew how to do the basics. And so, I mean, you did pretty well for yourself. Uh, you played for the Atlantis rugby squad, went to uh, Cuba and the Trinidad. Uh, what was, you know, your rugby experience like coming home from Australia, you know, to America, then to these other countries playing top-level rugby? It was fun. Um, it was it was a great experience. The rugby community is a fantastic community in that that it, it looks out it looks after its own. Um, so it's very much a pay it forward community. Um, because up until a few years ago, it wasn't professional. It was always an amateur game, and so you showed up for the love of it, uh, yeah. for the love of your you know the club, love of your teammates, just the love of competing in sport. Um, so when I came home from those trips, it was I I didn't see it as a um, kind of like a pedestal that I was standing on when I came back to my club teams. It was just a way, or I came home and, you know, introduced the opportunities to those, like, hey, guys, you can go play at this. You guys could try this. Um, it's it's not easy, but it's it's accessible if you want to make that commitment to it. Mm -hmm. and, and share, you know, my resources and the people that I met on these trips with those that are on my club team. Yeah, so uh, you made these connections and play for a few clubs actually overseas. And, um teams in Ireland and Berlin, I believe. So, uh, I mean, just describe the, you know, the experience of playing rugby, you know, abroad in these countries that are huge. Yeah, Ireland was awesome. It was it was an absolute game changer for me. I was 24 or 25 at the time, and I've been playing in the States for three or four years, and that was just kind of my, I wanted to go and I wanted to experience it, and I wanted to see what it was like. You know, everybody, once you get into the rugby community and you start playing a little bit, you're like, well, I want to play for the Eagles. I want to play for the U.S. Yeah. Um, you know, it was a it was a pie-in-the-sky thought, and in the back of my mind, I, I never really thought that I was going to get there, but I was always my, my motivating factor was that. And so I know uh, the opportunity to travel abroad and to play in a community that was totally immersed in the sport was exactly what I wanted and what I needed to do. Had I not gone there, I don't think I would have continued to play. Yeah. And so, I mean, you, you played, I mean, if we refocus here, so you play college sports, um, hockey and football, uh, play football for the two years, hockey for the four, and then you play these rugby, and you're playing overseas now against top-level talent. I mean, that's just crazy, everybody. So, uh, you know, you from uh, so after this time overseas, 2016, the pro rugby league uh, firms, which would eventually fold, but, uh, I mean, what did it mean for you to sign that professional contract when you did it in the pro rugby league? It was, it was one of the coolest feelings in my life, to be honest. Um, it, you, you just kind of see the culmination of, of your effort and the hard work that you put into it, and you're like, well, I'm, I'm signing this contract mm -hmm. to play professional. People are going to pay to watch me play. I mean, the contract wasn't big. It was, it was like a stipend amount. So, you know, I was making way more at my day job, but it didn't even matter. I would have quit my day job in a heartbeat for that had it not been for my girlfriend at the time saying, hey, uh, what are you doing? You know, so I, I had to stay focused on my ultimate goal was, you know, to continue my career path. But then also that was it was extreme. I still have the ticket from the first game that that I played professionally. I have the ticket. My girlfriend at the time, who's now my wife, she um, she was at the match. She has a ticket 
framed with a, a photo of me like shaking hands with like young kids, and it was unbelievable. Every time I look at the photo, I just smile. Yeah, this is fantastic. It was one of the best feelings I think I've ever had. Yeah, I mean that's crazy because, and we mentioned this last time. Um, you played for the Ohio Avatars, and so 2016. I mean, I had I was you know pretty young at the time. Still, I'm still pretty young, you could say. But uh, <laughs> I remember because I remember going on Instagram and um, it was Spike who followed me, and I was he said like the best professional rugby player in America. So I'm thinking this whole time like oh, the, and I was like a big fan of the Avatars then because he played for them and he followed me. So I was like, you know, I had to be a fan. So uh, it turns out, you know, I'm interviewing somebody on the team. That's pretty cool. So, uh, you know, the pro rugby lead eventually folded. And so from 2016 to 2018, um, you know, you're without professional rugby. Uh, what was happening in your life, you know, from 16 to 18? Um, well, I, was, I continued to play club rugby. Uh, a lot of us from that, that pro team. Ended up staying in Columbus. I lived in Columbus, so it was easy for me. Columbus is only about a two and a half hour drive south for from Cleveland, so that's where we were living at the time. And I had a job set up. Um, we had an apartment, but a lot of those people, a lot of the players in that pro team, ended up staying in Columbus. They got jobs working at uh, Tiger Rugby Academy. So I was still, you know, head first into the game. We were doing rugby academy every day. I was going to work. I was training in the morning. I'd go to work and come again and train at night with those guys. And then there were still tournaments, um, still a full season, like uh, club season that we played at with. Um, but it was kind of one of those things where we didn't really know exactly what was going to happen, whether we were going to continue to, to keep trying to do the rugby thing um, or, or just kind of bag it, enjoy it, play club rugby, and then, um, you know, continue our professional careers elsewhere. Yeah. I mean, I'm just thinking right now how crazy professional rugby's come because I see you now you know, you're a pro rugby player, and, like, I have stories because my uncle played college rugby. I mean, it's kind of just, you know, in a sense, like, it wasn't this huge thing in America, and now it's really grown massively. So, uh, we mentioned, you know, the gap year, and then the Major League Rugby recently um, launched just a few years back. So, uh, I mean, how was your past season with the uh, NOLA Gold in that Major League Rugby? Well, Major League Rugby was very cool. The opportunity that, you know, the people that, that wanted to, to get back involved with the professional setup and, and set this up. And, and from what I could tell and from feel around the league is that they're doing it very, they're doing it correctly. Um, first season with NOLA was, was a blast. It was a lot of growing pains. Um, cause you have, think about it this way. It is a startup business. Yeah. Um, so as a startup, you, you know, you're not really sure what to anticipate. All you know is that you have a passion for what the product is that you're providing. And so that kind of mm-hmm. kept us afloat that kept us focused, but, um, it was it was a lot of ups, a lot of downs. Um, that first season, I ended up breaking my face. So I missed the second half of the season with a broken orbital and a broken cheekbone. So I, that was that. So I only ended up getting four games that first eight-game season. I've kind of been lucky enough to continue to keep staying in the league, so that's been great. Yeah, and so, I mean, you're playing in New Orleans. So, I mean, out of rugby, you're living, you're, I mean, I assume you're living in New Orleans. What's it like to live in one of the... I mean, most passionate for Spurs cities in the world. Uh, New Orleans is cool. I I had a blast there. Um, there's always something to do. There's always a fun event. Um, there's always a a great social scene there. Yeah. You know, the, people are always looking to visit, which is totally fine. I enjoyed it. Um, I got to got to eat a whole bunch of fantastic food. I, I did Mardi Gras for the, the two years I was there. It was it was a blast. I would, you know, I've never would have done Mardi Gras without it. I highly recommend it to anybody. Um, it's, it's one of the craziest months ever. Um, but, but when I was there, I, you know, my fiance, we had gotten engaged after the first year down there. She still remained in Cleveland. Her work was here. And so I would go live down there for six months and then move back to Cleveland, move back home for six months. And so that's, that's kind of the trend that I've been keeping, um, you know, since I've been in the league is, is wherever I'm playing for six months and then back home for six months. And we bought a house in that time. So, you know, trying to look after a house. Um, you know, while I'm, you know, 16 hour drive away is, is difficult. And, you know, I just give credit to my wife for, for being strong as hell and, and keeping me focused and, and allowing me to, you know, to continue to live my dream, which has been fantastic on her. Yeah, it's amazing. So, uh, you now, you know, all, uh, not on the gold anymore, but you're still in the league, as you mentioned with the New England Free Jacks. Uh, I mean, what are your personal goals for the season whenever, it, you know, it resumes? Uh, my personal goals, you know, you know, it's it's always going into the season. 
you know, you, you want to win the competition. That's that's your definite goal. As a team, as a unit, as an organization, you want to win it. As, as an individual, I am definitely a veteran. Being in the league for four years, I've, I've seen where it's gone and see where it's where it's at and where hopefully I have a good idea of where it's going to go. Um, but my thing, I just want to, you know, continue to, to bring a high quality of play, you know, to continue to be a contributor to the team on the field, but then also provide some intangibles off the field, you know, leadership, um, experience, bringing the younger guys up to speed. We just had a, a collegiate draft, which was fantastic. Okay. So we've got college kids entering the league now, um, you know, that have that avenue to get into the league. And it's, it's passing down what I know, what I've learned, and helping those young kids out, um, you know, so they could, when they're ready to take the jersey, uh, because they've got to take it, I'm not going to give it to them now, but when they're ready to take the jersey, you know, they're going to be prepared for it, and they're going to know what it takes to, to get it and what it means to wear it. Yeah, so, I mean, I was actually going to mention that because I was thinking of that, you know, in the, from the last time we talked to now, the draft of Conor Manningham going number one and stuff. So, uh, I mean, out of rugby, uh, you were once a model with uh, Abercrombie and Fitch. Um, <laughs> I mean, anything you know you want to say about that time with them? Uh, that was it was fun. It was cool. It was it was um, yeah, it was definitely fun. It's yeah. cool to say, you know, cool to do it. It's a fun experience. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not much. So, uh, I mean, you know, you had you know rugby. It's definitely a growing sport, and you know, you're kind of here at the start of it. So, uh, I mean, you know, the opportunities you got you got to make you know you know a name for yourself outside the game too, which you're doing right now. With the uh, what do you do podcast, um, all about you know what people do uh, for a living, not these you know professional athletes, but it's just these regular people. Um, is there anything you want to share with the audience about that podcast and uh, what you're doing with it? Yeah, so I've got a podcast. It's called What Do You Do. Uh, you could find it on any of the big podcast servers or on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play. Um, but yeah, so because I, I don't really know what I want to do for a job when rugby's finally finished, which is quickly approaching. Um, so I just thought, I was like, well, I'm going to just talk to my friends, see what they actually do, what their days look like. And, you know, I've had, I've had almost 20 conversations, 20 recorded conversations, 16 of which are up on, up on the podcast right now, but I'm kind of getting a better feel for, uh, for the jobs, you know, what they take and maybe kind of feeling out what I want to do with it. And, you know, I hope it helps people out. Um, you know, I've had friends, one of my buddies actually plays on the team, said he listened to the, uh, I've got one on a construction project manager. Mm -hmm. He goes, Strip, I, I listen to the project manager one. I, I wanted to, do, I want to do that when I'm done with rugby. I, I appreciate your podcast. It was good. I got a good idea of what it takes, or you know, or what's kind of involved. And so that's that. You know, that's what I'm trying to provide, and mainly just I want to learn myself. So yeah, <laughs> I'm so, glad others could benefit. Yeah. So I mean, that's great, and because you don't really hear too many pod, like most of the podcasts you listen to, like, like Joe Rogan's the big one, I guess. It's you know these actors, uh, comedians, or whatever, so, I mean, it's cool to see, you know, these down-to-earth people working, you know, these, you know, uh, down-to-earth jobs or whatever, and, I mean, it's great that you're doing that, so, uh, if you want to check it out, it will be in the description and everything, so, uh, now we'll My guy! Uh, so, now we'll just do some more rapid-fire questions, um, a little different than the ones we did before, because I don't want to do the same, so, uh, uh, what is your favorite joke? Favorite joke? Gosh, that was a good... You should have prepped me for these, dude. Yeah. I don't have a favorite joke. Um, I've got nothing off the top of my head. I feel like an idiot now. Uh, maybe it's just say knock-knock for the heck of it. Yeah, yeah, I could throw a knock-knock out there. Yeah, so, I can make something good up. Yeah, so uh, what is one thing that annoys you the most? People chewing with their mouth open. Yeah, I can, I can attest to that. So uh, that's nasty. So uh, who was your favorite cartoon character and why? Favorite cartoon character? Um, Robin Hood. He's the man. Robin Hood or Peter Pan? All day. Uh, how many books have you read this year so far? Since, since January? Probably yeah. about 15, 16. Jeez, so uh, very studious. So uh, what is your, uh, well, I mean, you know, being a professional athlete, but uh, what is your lifelong dream, like from when you were a kid? I mean, like what was the crazy thing you wanted to do? I always wanted, like you said, I always wanted to be a professional athlete, but then I, I don't know, I've always wanted to be the guy that everybody likes. Like, you know, the, the cool dude on the street who people want to hang out with. Yeah. That's kind of been my thing. Yeah, I don't know why, it's kind of weird. I never thought about it like that, but yeah. Yeah, so, um, what is the worst job you could have? So, you know, talking about finding a good job, what's the worst job you could have? <sighs> I've had some brutal ones. Um, 
Jeez, I don't know. I love manual labor. I think the worst job you could have is sitting in an office and you're not able to speak to anybody. You're just on a computer all the time and it's just you and the computer. Yeah, so what, Nike or Adidas? I'm mixed. I want to say Adidas, but I'm a Nike guy. Yeah, that's me. It depends what, you know, it is. Shoes, you know, T-shirts. Yeah, it depends the apparel. I mean, I've got Nike boots, but I used to wear Adidas boots, but I'd say probably Nike. I like Adidas socks over the Nike socks, though. Yeah, so uh, now it said, if you could win any award, what would it be and why? Uh, I'd love to win an ESPY. I'd love to win a sports person of the year or sport, you know, something like yeah. that. Or That'd be sick. Yeah, I was actually just watching the ESPYs. Um, it was a bit the virtual ESPYs just a few nights ago, so that was pretty cool. Yeah, so you posted that. Yeah, yeah. So uh, what is the song uh, you hear the most often? The song I hear the most often. There's a Mac Miller song that I listen to constantly. Oh, shoot, hold on. I don't even. I don't even know what the name of it is. I just there's just a line in it that I just listen over and over and over and over and over and over and over again, and it gets me jacked up. Oh, there's a bit of it. It's called the question. Mac Miller, the question, okay. nonstop, yeah. always in my headphones. Yeah. So we got um about three more here. Um, are you a morning or a night person? Morning. Yeah, so in the morning, though, what's the first thing you do? Brush my teeth. Okay, uh, wait, so do you eat breakfast and brush your teeth? Nah, yeah. I know, dude. That's how I roll. Nah, I know. Once I get up. Yeah, but, like, I, I just don't, I eat breakfast and I'll brush my teeth. Um, and then, <laughs> yeah. So, don't judge me. Yeah, so, uh, <laughs> so lastly, um, here, what is your least favorite food? Oh, no, we got one more after this. What's your least favorite food? Okay. Olives. Nah. Um, Don't come near me with olives. In, uh, so, in uh, three words, describe yourself. Um, personable, athletic, and genuine. Yeah, I think we could uh, say athletic was a lot. So, like you said. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I mean, thank you, you know, for joining the show, everybody. Um, this is uh, Zach Striffler, and make sure to check out all of his stuff, which is in the description below. I mean, thank you for coming on and doing this again. Uh, really means a lot, and, you know, wishing you all the best with everything. Appreciate it, man. My pleasure. Keep doing it. Yeah. I'm loving your stuff, Chris. You're the man. Thank you. Thank you. Chris Daly, off.